Hello, I'm Gordon Earle. During this segment of Einstein On, we'll be talking about stem cell research, as well as its promises, possibilities, and risks with Dr. Paul Frenette. Paul is director of the Ruth L. and David S. Gottesman Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Research at Einstein. He's an expert on blood stem cell research, vascular biology, and sickle cell anemia. Paul, thanks for joining us. Now, there's been a lot of hype as well as, well as a lot of valid science about stem cell research. So let's start at the beginning. What are stem cells and why are they so important? A stem cell is, is defined by two major characteristics, I would say. The first, uh, the most important, is to self-renew. So a stem cell must be able to replicate itself, and that's a major characteristic of a stem cell. And then a second characteristic is really to be able to differentiate and form a progeny, a differentiated progeny, that function. We'll be talking about that differentiation in a second, but for the moment, tell me about which treatments, stem cell treatments, are most promising and most proven at this time. Well, clearly, the most proven is, is the, the blood stem cell uh, transplantation. So hematologists have been transplanting hematopoietic stem cells now for uh, about 50 years or so. So that, that is the, practically the only therapy, stem cell therapy, that is approved, that works very robustly, and uh, that's used also very fairly commonly in hospitals. Now, there are other tissue uh, transplant where stem cells play roles, for example, corneal transplantation or skin grafts where you have stem cells in these tissues that are very important, but that's not, you know, it's done as a tissue. It's not really done as a purified stem cell for now. The other therapies are really, that we hear about, are really experimental. So that means that they, they are still, we're, we, they're, still under, they're still under study, we don't know if they work, and we also don't know if they're safe. Uh, so that's being tested, and hopefully some of these will emerge as being important uh, for, for patients. The differentiation that you've talked about is key to understanding uh, stem cells and how they become unique cells in the body, such as liver or blood cells. How well do we understand that process? How well do the people in your lab truly understand this process, which is so vital to human life? Well, my lab doesn't understand this at all. <laughs> so, uh, not the liver. We can deal with blood uh, somewhat, but we, as, as, you know, as a whole, scientists are, are beginning to understand the, the, the process of differentiation and getting better and better at getting the cells that, that we want. Um, but there's still so much to learn. It's unbelievable. So there's a, it's a very, very difficult uh, process. And it's very complex. Uh, you can make blood cells in, in, from embryonic stem cells in the tissue culture dish. And you can make stem cells, probably. But these stem cells don't engraft. And that's a major puzzle. Uh, and, and problem for researchers. People have been working on this for, for uh, decades and no one has been able to find a solution for this. So that explains to some degree uh, why stem cells act differently in the lab than they do, they do in the human body. Are you saying that our ability to understand the differentiation of stem cells and to do it better, to understand it better, will lead to better stem cell treatments? Oh, definitely. I think to get to stem cell therapy, you have to know everything about the cells you're going to be injecting. So that's critical. Let's say the disease affects the heart. You can differentiate the, the cells into cardiac cells and study the function, the function of these cardiomyocytes in the tissue culture dish. And that could be used for drug screening and for other studies about the disease process. The same thing is done, for example, with Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's disease probably will not going to cure by cell therapy, but we might get some insights by studying cells that have been made from Alzheimer's disease patient to understand how the disease um, evolves. I want to drill down a little bit uh, more into your specific research, especially with bone marrow. Now, none of this can happen without good researchers, and our producer actually ran into some of your team members on the five train home from work. We turned around and we came back to Einstein and we talked to them in their lab. 
So we're going to show that next because uh, it shows the, the passion as well as the effectiveness of your research. I'm Sandra. I'm a postdoc in Paul Frenet's lab and I'm working on multiplying, expanding, growing uh, blood stem cells. They are very important stem cells because they are able to form all your blood cells, all your immune system. Here in the lab we discovered another population of stem cells also exist in the same place than the blood ones. It's called mesenchyma stem cells inside of the bone. And they are able to keep the blood stem cell happy. So we transfer all of these knowledge to our petri dishes in the lab. So here we have an image of uh, both mesenchyma stem cells and blood stem cells, the small ones around. When we put together mesenchymal stem cells and blood stem cells, we hope that the mesenchymal stem cells uh, will somehow have an impact on the blood stem cells and, then, and make them grow and multiply. So if we expand blood stem cells in the laboratory and able later on to give them to patients and they would behave exactly as they should, like giving rise to a whole new blood system, that would be great. Uh, so basically that's, that's our long-term goal. My name is Jalal Ahmed, I'm an MD-PhD student at Mount Sinai and I work at Albert Einstein as part of a collaboration between the two institutions. And my interest is in studying the formation of blood in the embryo. What's really interesting is how many things can come from single sources. So like all of us, we're, we come from a single cell and if we look at just the blood within our bodies, they all actually originate from very rare populations uh, as we're developing. The majority of the expansion of blood happens within the livers of the embryo. So this is an ultrasound uh, image of a mouse embryo. This is the head of the embryo. You can actually see its heart beating. And this is the liver. So the liver in the embryo is actually just a giant vat for blood. It provides signals that tell the blood to grow. We believe if we can understand what signals are being given to the blood, we can understand how to grow blood ourselves. So if, if there's a need for blood in any situation, if there's a trauma or uh, some other disease uh, which, which requires the transplantation of blood, uh, it, it may be necessary to, to transplant the patient. And generally what happens is that uh, we, we find relatives or a matched donor um, to give us some bone marrow and we can use that to replace the blood system of, of the patient. Um, however, there are complications that arise when you use donor blood and there may not even be a source. Our motivation for our work is to perhaps find a way to grow the patient's own bone marrow and then offer that to them as in, in that situation when they would need it. Um, and in that case, we wouldn't need to rely on a matched donor and it would be a very safe and effective treatment. My name is uh, Christoph Scheiermann. I'm an instructor here at Einstein. And together with my uh, colleague Yuya Kunisaki, we work on circadian rhythms primarily. Specifically, we are really interested in um, how uh, different populations of uh, hematopoietic cells, especially stem cells, migrate um, to the bone marrow. And this, interestingly, this doesn't happen just randomly, but this is really uh, enhanced in, in the mouse. Of course, we look at the mouse uh, currently. This is enhanced at night. But of course, um, the mouse is nocturnal. Uh, humans, at least most of us, uh, are diurnal, so they're you know, mostly awake during the day. Whereas in the, in the mouse, these uh, hematopoietic stem cells migrate to the bone marrow more, uh, more strongly uh, at night because they are nocturnal, so they are active during the night. Um, in, the in the human, this would happen more strongly at their activity phase, so in the morning. For the bone marrow transplantation scenario, if you give the transplant in the morning, you would have, uh, you have a much higher efficiency uh, for these cells to restore uh, hematopoiesis. We've just seen some of the passion of the people in your lab. So tell us, put it in perspective for us, you know, what they're doing and, and what you're doing. Put the whole, paint the picture for us. So we've been uh, interested in, in cell migration for, for a number of years. Even before we got into the stem cell field, we were studying how blood cells migrate and, and we became interested in, in how stem cells, blood stem cells migrate. But we stumbled on an interesting discovery and we found that the, the nerves or a branch uh, of the autonomic nervous system that's called the sympathetic nervous system. It's basically the, the nervous system that's involved in, in, in the, the uh, flight or, or fight responses. That branch is, is regulating uh, stem cells through what we call the microenvironment or the stem cell niche. And 
these signals play a role in the migration of cells. And what's very uh, interesting is that, is that um, you have fluctuations, for example, in, in the ability of, of, of stem cells to migrate, uh, whether you're, if you're testing, for example, animals or people in the morning or at night, you'll have different levels of stem cells in blood. And that's regulated by the nervous system. We'll make the connection between the nervous system work that you're doing and, and cancer and the metastasis of cancer, because I found that very, very interesting. So we're just beginning in, 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 in some ways in these studies. So the idea behind this is we're thinking that, that um, so it's controversial whether there's a cancer of stem cells, but I happen to believe that there might be, or there's a cell that has very similar property to a stem cell that lives in the cancer, and that these cells may, may also have similar behaviors. So we've been studying some, uh, the role of, of nerves in, in tumors and in the, in the development of tumors and in, in, uh, in leukemias, but also in solid tumors and the microenvironment that, that regulates that process. And hopefully we'll make, we'll make interesting insights. Now I know you're, you don't want to go too far on this because you just started, but is the idea if you could modify the nervous system that you might be able to modify the spread of the cancer? That's the idea, that's the idea. So we're interested really in the early phases of tumors. So what happens when you have a tumor? Because the tumor doesn't kill you. What kills you is the spreading of the tumor. So it's very important to understand what makes the tumor spread. And that's what we're trying to understand. The early steps that will lead to the migration of tumor cells outside of the primary tumor. We have you know, other projects that, that, that are more translational, looking at the human bone marrow too, because all that is in the mouse, but what happens, of course, that's important. What happens in the human bone marrow? How, how is the blood formed? What are the niche cells? And if we understand this, we may be able to go back to uh, the lab and be able to expand uh, hematopoietic stem cell, which is a major um, issue in uh, transplantation. So that's something I didn't discuss before, is the, the use of core blood cells. It's another type of stem cells that can be used instead of, of bone marrow uh, in some patients. So it's widely available, so that's the great thing about it. And it's used when you don't have a match for transplantation, you'll use core blood cells. And in, in if, if it, even when it doesn't match perfectly, it works uh, well. The problem is that there are very few stem cells in the core blood isolate. So you can only transplant children or people that are you know, smaller people, or you have to give two different cords in the same person. And that's, that's being done. But even with that, there's still there's some delay in engraftment. It still doesn't work properly. So that's why a lot of people in the field are trying to expand these cells. And I think if we understand the microenvironment will be able to expand these cells more efficiently and more safely. That's what we and other groups in, in the world are, are working on, are thinking about, and are excited about. Well, that leads into our next segment, so you know, thanks a lot, Paul. And our next segment, uh, we'll be talking with Dr. Paul Fernet about the use of stem cells both to treat and possibly cure disease.